As the Time Lords were only established in 1969, neither the viewers or the cast or crew knew the Doctor's backstory completely up until that point. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the first Doctor is only a human scientist. Um, this was fully explained in a great video by Terry Nation Army, linked above. These are warlike aliens that look like turtles that appear in multiple Virgin New Adventures. They're one of the few spin-off creations to be referenced in the actual show, with River stating that one of their ships is above Stonehenge in the Pandorica Opens. Frobisher is a companion of the 6th and 7th Doctors from the Doctor Who magazine. He's a Whifferdill, which is a kind of shape-shifting alien, but he's most well known for his form as a talking penguin. This is a big Finnish audio series about the Daleks invading the Milky Way. It's mainly about the people subjugated and their resistance. This is a complicated one. Jeffrey Beavers is an actor who played the Master in his final regeneration, where he's been burnt to a crisp and needs to find new ways to prolong his life. Beavers only appeared in one TV story, but he was the only actor still alive and willing to return to the role in the early Big Finish days, so he became their main master actor, and he appeared in a huge amount of audios. The three refers to the fact that they wanted to have him meet later Doctors, but because he was the master opposite Tom Baker, they had to come up with a complicated solution to this. So, in The Keeper of Traken, he's the master uh, on TV, and that's Beavers 1. Then the master possesses Anthony Ainley, there's that master, but in the audios the possession is reversed and the master returns to his burnt form. So that's now Beavers 2, and he fights the Seventh Doctor. Then he's executed by the Daleks, becomes a snake, possesses Eric Roberts, is eaten by the TARDIS, escapes, and reforms his original Time Lord body, which becomes the third time he's in this body, aka Beavers 3 eventually dies and is resurrected as Alex McQueen. Gruntible plays the master who's exterminated at the beginning of the TV movie. Here he is. Did you miss him? Well, originally he was meant to have a larger role, with set photos showing his full makeup and costume that's reminiscent of the Anthony Ainley incarnation, and with the master doing the original opening narration before it was changed to Paul McGann. In the final film, it's hard to tell that he's even an actor, not a model, so it's actually nice to see some of this work even if it's in unfinished form. So in the Eighth Doctor Adventures, a war in the Doctor's personal future is hinted at often. The Time Lords are preparing for it, and the Doctor's corpse from a battle in it is seen. Um, the enemy is unknown as of yet, or their evil cells, but I'm not sure if that's ever directly stated. Uh, and it's said that when final contact happens and the enemy is discovered, then the war becomes inevitable. So this war that would tear the universe apart in conflict is averted because the Doctor destroys Gallifrey before the war can even start. So in the Eighth Doctor Adventures world, the war never happened because Gallifrey ceased to exist. Giant war that leads to the destruction of Gallifrey. A bit similar to the Time War, you might think. So some people like to think that these wars are the same war and the unnamed enemy were the Daleks and the Doctor didn't stop it um, and his destruction of Gallifrey ends up being the same as in the TV show. Other people like to think that Gallifrey was destroyed twice and some like to ignore the Ape Doctor adventures. It's kind of up to you what you want to do there. Compassion is a companion of the Ape Doctor in the Ape Doctor adventures. She comes from a people called the Remote, who were a group of people artificially copied or remembered from other folk in a way that's far too complicated to get into here, um, by Faction Paradox, who we'll come back to. She had a neural implant that through contact with the TARDIS and some Time Lord shenanigans, turned her into a sentient TARDIS, and at that point the Doctor travelled around inside her. The Ape Doctor adventures are very weird. Shada was meant to be the final story in Season 17, but due to strikes it was never finished. Many people have tried to finish it since. So many, in fact, that I'm not actually sure which five versions this refers to, but you can pick from the original script, the VHS with Tom Baker's linking narration, the novelization, the animated version made by the BBC, the animated version made by Super Fanny and Levine, the Dirk Gently books, which Douglas Adams reused a lot of material from Shada for, the webcast remake starring Paul McGann instead of Tom Baker, the audio version of the remake starring Paul McGann, which has extra scenes, the Shada prison within the world of the show, 
or the unmade version from the Legally Bible, something that we will never speak of again. A spin-off audio about the life of Davros before his first appearance in Genesis of the Daleks. This covers his life as a child, to being a scientist, to being injured, to creating the prototype Daleks. Trevor Martin played the Doctor in a stage play named Doctor Who and the Seven Keys to Doomsday, where he faced off against the Daleks. The play was performed in 1974 during Pertwee's final season, and Martin plays a potential fourth Doctor, but just not the one we now know. He returned to play the part again when Big Finish adapted the story to audio. Iris Wildtime is sort of possibly a Time Lord, maybe she's a clockwork, who knows, who travels around in a London bus shaped TARDIS slash space time travel machine, depending on where you're writing this, that's smaller on the inside, getting into mischief, drinking, and partying. She's written by Paul Mars, mostly, who loves meta jokes, so she often references other stories in cheeky ways and acts in ways that seem inappropriate for a character in Doctor Who. The most famous regeneration is the audio version played by Katie Manning, who also played Joe Grant, who travels with a talking panda toy. This is the Doctor's school gang. It includes the Master, the Rani, the Monk, a comedy geezer named Drax, a guy who's obviously the blueprint for the Master called Magnus or the War Chief, and a bunch of nobodies. <laughs> the first Doctor Who animated webcast released in 2001. It's got the Seventh Doctor, Ace, the Brigadier, and Stephen Fry as the Minister of Chance, a fun new Time Lord who got his own spin-off later. This story is very odd and features the end of the Time Lords, the Time Lords having godlike psychic powers, and the Doctor's death. Um, it's not regarded as canon by most people. I don't know why. This is something that the second Doctor says just after regenerating. The implication is that the Doctor isn't actually naturally capable of changing his form, and instead it was the TARDIS that did it for him. As seen in later stories, however, Time Lords often regenerate far from their ships, so it kind of ends up being a reference that's never really picked up on. Some fans have taken this to mean that the TARDIS helped the Doctor remain in control after the change, in the same way that the Fifth Doctor needs his ship in Castrovalva, but since Triton doesn't pop to the Zero Room, I think it's just something that was kind of ignored by later production teams. This is a race of weapon builders who were destroyed by one of their own creations. They're mainly notable as they appear in a comic strip written by the legendary Alan Moore of Watchmen from Hell, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen fame. An unmade story from the Colin Baker era. After the failure of season 22, Doctor Who went on hiatus for 18 months, and when it returned it told the single Trial of a Time Lord story, and it scrapped all the original scripts written for a potential season 23. Mission to Magnus is one of these, and featured a return appearance from Sil from Vengeance of Varos and the Ice Warriors. Sil actually did return in the real Season 23 in Mind Warp, but that story is completely different except for his return. Mission to Magnus was later novelised and then adapted for audio for Big Finish's Lost Stories range, uh, which features many of these unmade scripts. Another family of Rex Coracle Falcatorians. These are by far the most obscure, appearing only in a single short story. Blake Seven is an original sci-fi TV show that ran from 1978 to 1981. It tells the story of freedom fighters under the rule of an evil federation in a kind of cynical, dystopian reversal of Star Trek. While it's its own property, it has a huge amount of connections to Doctor Who, from cast to crew to general aesthetic. Because of this, there's a lot of crossover in fandoms. Also, there were plans for a crossover, either with the Daleks appearing as a villain in Blake 7, or Blake and the Doctor walking past each other in a corridor in a kind of little cameo scene. During the season 22-23 break, script editor Eric Sayward wrote this audio story that starred the Sixth Doctor and Perry, and it was broadcast on Radio 4. It's seen by some as a forerunner of the audio dramas of the 1990s onwards, um, but it's also not very good. To give it its full title, Recall Unit, The Great Teabag Mystery, was a 1984 play featuring the 1970s unit cast, although Nicholas Courtney only appeared as a recording, written and directed by Richard Franklin, who played Mike Yates. Um, I couldn't find very much information about this beyond these two images. Dak is a human criminal sentenced to death who decided to become a Dalek killer instead. He fought in the Dalek Wars of the 26th century. He appeared in comics and novels in the 90s, and he even had his own novelty single. 
He's a very kind of 90s, angry, cool guy, so was generally abandoned after them, but he's appeared in the 11th Doctor comic series more recently, and he had a tiny cameo as a picture of a criminal in Time Heist. This is the name given to the little skits that Tom Baker recorded for 1999's Doctor Who Night. He appears in character as the Doctor, but he talks about all the clips as things that have happened to him, even those of later Doctors than the fourth, implying that he's a later regeneration. It's mainly just kind of silly fun, but since Day of the Doctor established the character of the Curator, a future Doctor that looks like Tom Baker, fans have kind of wondered if these skits are actually in-universe. <laughs> An 8th Doctor adventure novel written by Lawrence Miles, uh, this is the thing that establishes Faction Paradox and the Second War in Heaven, and it revolves around the auction of the corpse of the Doctor from the future. Marvel Comics UK used to publish Doctor Who Weekly, which became Doctor Who magazine, alongside other Doctor Who comics. More interesting than kind of publication rights, however, is that during this time, the Doctor crossed over with the Marvel Universe. The Seventh Doctor briefly travelled with a cyborg, robot, metallic life form called Death's Head before leaving him in his home universe, a universe where he worked with a series of major Marvel characters. An unmade TV story, then an unmade film written by Douglas Adams who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and wrote a number of Doctor Who stories and was the script editor for season 17. This was a highly comedic story about evil androids who looked like cricket players. Some elements were reused in later Hitchhiker's books, and the story was actually eventually adapted into a novel in 2018. Big Finish made a series of unbound audios, which were essentially what-if stories. Arabella Weir appeared in one which asked, What if the Doctor was a woman? The answer is apparently that she'd be an alcoholic who worked in a supermarket. I don't like this story. A comic spin-off of the Ape Doctor adventures. Miranda was the Doctor's adopted daughter in a story called Father Time, and this comic shows her backstory as the heiress to a giant spaceship slash colony at the end of time called the Needle. Also her dad, the Emperor, is implied to be a future incarnation of the Doctor. So David Warner is an actor who appears in so many different sci-fi properties, it's kind of hard to name, including one episode of Doctor Who, the TV show, as a Soviet scientist, and many, many audios as various characters. He's probably included on this list because of his role as the Unbound Doctor, though. His story in the Unbound series originally asked, what if the Doctor didn't arrive on Earth after his trial until the 1990s? So in this universe, all the 1970s alien invasions happened, but the Doctor didn't stop them, so the world is a huge mess. Warner's portrayal was so successful that he appeared in a sequel on an alternate Scarrow before his entire universe was canonised by being visited by Bernie Summerfield in her audio series. Currently, Warner's alternate Doctor has actually travelled with Benny into the Prime Universe, so there's actually two Doctors knocking about in the official Doctor Who world. In the audio story Colditz, the Nazis get a hold of Ace's CD player and the Doctor's TARDIS and conquer the world. This was undone when a Nazi scientist, Elizabeth Klein from the future, comes back to the 1940s in the future TARDIS and the Doctor and Ace use this foreknowledge to stop the Nazi takeover before it happened. How did Klein fly the TARDIS though? The Doctor assumes that his future alternate self helped her after regenerating into a form that she wouldn't recognise, and this is confirmed in Klein's story, where the alternate ape Doctor is played by none other than Paul McGann. So, Faction Paradox are a little bit difficult to explain, since they appear both in the Doctor Who universe and their own spin-off novel slash comic slash audio line, and that line uses alternate terms for things to avoid copyright issues. Um, such as the home world instead of Gallifrey. And it actually could be viewed to occur in an alternate timeline from the mainline Doctor Who world as well. In the most simple terms, Faction Paradox are a time travelling cult, who might have originally been a House of Time Lords, who reject the Time Lords' main idea that the universe should be rational and ordered, and they instead prefer kind of freedom and uh, the idea that you can like make your own choices and like things being paradoxical, kind of hence their name. 
In the Ape Doctor Adventures, they generally appear as antagonists working against the Time Lords in the lead up to the Second War in Heaven and invading Gallifrey just before the Doctor destroyed it. But in their own series, they are the protagonists, and while sometimes they engage in slightly suspect behaviour, they're generally preferable to the Great Houses, aka the Time Lords, attempts to claim domination over time. The big difference between the Ape Doctor adventure world and the Faction Paradox world is that the Doctor appears to avert the war in the Ancestor Cell, uh, whereas it occurs in the Paradox books and novels. This is kind of complicated and there are people out there now who are bigger fans of Faction Paradox who are shaking their head at all the horrible mistakes I just made. Devil's End is the location of the third Doctor story, The Daemons, but this refers to a spin-off set there starring Olivia Hawthorne, a local witch. It's made by a company called Real Time Pictures, who from the 1980s onwards produced low budget films um, featuring Doctor Who characters. These are sort of fan films, but the way that Doctor Who is copyrighted um, ends up that most of the characters actually belong to the specific writers of their stories rather than the BBC. So new officially licensed material with them can be produced. Uh, without the BBC's consent, as long as you have the author's consent, as long as it doesn't mention the Doctor or the TARDIS or something that's sort of really directly owned by the BBC. The City of the Saved was a galaxy-sized city ship that existed between the end of the universe and the beginning of the next. It was inhabited by resurrected versions of every human that ever lived, rescued from the all-consuming Second War in Heaven. Some were members of Faction Paradox, some were manifested versions of fictional characters. The city was actually the future form of compassion as a city-sized TARDIS. I don't really know much more as my Faction Paradox knowledge is very weak. Does this have any relation to the Needle, a giant light year long city ship that existed at the end of the universe filled with humanoids and made out of an old TARDIS? Probably not. So I think this refers to the Time Lord who uses the number of their incarnation as their name. They appear most often in the audio dramas as the Eleven, but we've also heard the Eight, the Nine, and the Twelve. So generally they're a villain, and they were driven mad by the personalities of their previous incarnations staying in their conscious mind after regeneration, leading to more and more multiple personality disorders. They were briefly considered a companion of the Ape Doctor, but this was kind of part of their evil scheme, so I don't really count it. This is another licensed spin-off like Devil's End, this time made by BBV Productions, and featuring Caroline John as Liz Shaw. This is the first in a series called Probe, where Shaw investigates various unnatural happenings, which feature tons of Doctor Who actors in new roles, and which were actually mainly written by Mark Gattis of later official Doctor Who and Sherlock fame. Telus Publishing originally produced a series of Doctor Who novellas, one of which, The Cabinet of Light, was a hard-boiled detective story with an unspecified Doctor. After losing the license to release official Doctor Who novels, Telus published the Time Hunter series, which starred Honoré Les Assure and Emily Blandish from The Cabinet of Light as private investigators of the supernatural. Several Doctor Who concepts appear, including the Fendal and the Daemons, and there are several characters who are kind of implied to be the Doctor or the Master throughout. This is a series of gothic mystery novels and audios starring two little old ladies in a seaside village. They're highly metafictional and camp, with Brenda implied to be the aged bride of Frankenstein and Effie being a witch. They have a kind of loose connection with the Doctor Who universe, with crossovers with uh, Iris Wildtime's companion Panda appearing in one novel, and a joint crossover between the Ape Doctor Adventure novels Mad Dogs and Englishmen and the Scarlet Empress and the Brenda and Effie series published in 2017. John and Jillian are the Doctor's grandchildren in the 1960s comic strip, who travel with him in the TARDIS. They appear with both the first and second Doctors. Their adventures are generally far sillier and light-hearted than those broadcast on TV, and they seem to just kind of be two human children from the present day, which connects with the idea of the first two Doctors as human scientists. Later media has tried to wreck on them as being a dream or existing in the land of fiction, but I kind of like to think they're real, just to canonise the time that Doctor Who met Santa. The Forge is a secret organisation that reveres the British Empire and salvages alien technology to use to its own nefarious purposes. They're basically kind of like Torchwood, except appearing in Doctor Who audio since 2001 as recurring villains. 
Their leader is a guy called Nimrod, who's a human infected with a vampire virus, which allows him to live for hundreds of years. They were involved in schemes including a multiversal language controlling being called the Word Lord, a clone of the Sixth Doctor, vampires, and stuff to do with Hex, the Sim Doctor's companion's mother. There were a couple of novels and a comic book based on them, but as far as I can see their final appearance was in 2010. Benedetti played a female regeneration of the Doctor in a series of fan films from the 1980s. I have a feeling that she might have been the first woman to play the part in any kind of released media, but I'm not sure about that. Maybe people can confirm this in the comments. Another fan Doctor. This one's meant to exist between the second and third Doctors due to actor Tony Garner's alleged resemblance to both Troughton and Pertwee. This is one of the more famous fan productions as Pertwee makes a brief cameo, footage of which was released on the DVD of the War Games. The final film to feature Barbara Benedetti as the Doctor. I'm not super up on fan made material so I don't really know much about these entries. Bildon's another British fantasy TV legend who appears in Doctor as a minor character and then as the Doctor in the Unbound series. His idea is what if the Doctor never left Gallifrey and features Carol Ann Ford as Susan Foreman again. This is kind of interesting though because Bildon was actually considered for the role of the first and second Doctor so it gives a little insight into an alternate world where he actually took the part. So this is another BBD production, but instead of licensing out a minor character, this time they hired Colin Baker and Nicola Bryan, the actors of The Sixth Doctor, and had them play characters called The Stranger and Ms. Brown. There's quite a few Stranger stories and eventually they had to distance them more from Doctor Who or get sued, but the original idea was basically just do Doctor Who but with the names very slightly edited. Another Unbound story. This time the idea is what if Doctor Who was cancelled after only a few stories. Derek Jacobi appears as a writer in a care home who confuses his identity with the Doctor. I won't say much more but this is easily the best Unbound story. A 10th anniversary special release by BBV celebrating their time as a producer of weird Doctor Who knockoffs. It's a parody film starring Sylvester McCoy's The Foot Doctor that features loads of weird Doctor Who references and knockoff slash licensed aliens. The final and most upsetting officially licensed fan production on here, this is a horror slash thriller where the shape-changing Zygon has a romance and does some murders. There's also a Zygon sex scene which makes this one of the most cursed things on the iceberg. Remember how I mentioned that the Faction Paradox series changed the name of stuff for copyright slash artistic reasons? The Greater Key is basically their name for the moment, the super weapon the Doctor ends up not using in Day of the Doctor. The Greater Key is a reference to the Key of Rassilon, which is part of the DMAT gun, which is a weapon that removes targets from time. Before the release of The Day of the Doctor, there were references and spin-off material to the Doctor using the Key of Rassilon to create a weapon for the Time War, and this tries to combine those with what we saw on screen. AO3 is a Doctor Who fanfiction site. As I said, I don't really know much about the Who fan scene, um, so I'm guessing some people like to think of this as canon, and that's what this refers to. There's no noddy. So that was the iceberg. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I quite enjoyed looking into all the subjects because a lot of it was stuff which I think I kind of knew about before, um, but I hadn't really researched very much. Like I kind of was aware of stuff like Brenda and Effie, but I didn't really know what was what the story was behind it. Um, yeah, I, it was a lot of fun doing it, um, and I think I might actually try and do some other icebergs in the future if this does well and people seem to like it. I'm tempted to do a Star Trek one which I found online, and if anyone sees any for stuff like uh, Twin Peaks or Alien, I might be interested in doing those, or another BBC kind of British t sci-fi thing. If there's one for Blake 7, which there definitely isn't, I would do that. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I, as I said, please go over to my original channel and check out some of the stuff on there. Uh, and thanks for watching.